Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of The Daily Dose. We are cruising right along through. You remember what book we're in? I hope you do. We're in 2 Chronicles. That's right, 2 Chronicles. We're looking at chapters 9 through 12 today. This is our 228th day, and we are ever so close to starting the book of Matthew. So what we're going to do today, as is our custom, is we're going to kind of glance through some of the major bullet points of our, our text from Chronicles today. Now, again, I say this every day, just in case you haven't been here in a while, I'm going to say it again. I'm not going into very much detail on the summary through the books of First Chronicles and Second Chronicles because most of it is just review material. It's going back over events, um, chronicling the history of stuff that happened during the, um, the patriarchal period in the Old Testament. Um, it goes into a little bit more detail and spends a little bit more time um, on David's life, and then it goes in Second Chronicles into info about Solomon's life, and then it goes on to the period of the kings, and so on and so forth, right? So I'm just going to hit some of the major bullet points just to let you guys know what to expect as you read through Chronicles, but then we're going to jump over to the psalm that we have on the menu for today, Psalm 73. I'm going to read through some of that and comment along the way, okay? So as far as Second Chronicles goes, again, we're looking at chapters 9 through 12, this starts off with the famous story about the Queen of Sheba visiting Solomon, right? Uh, then we move on to a section that talks about Solomon's splendor, right? We read about the, the grandeur and magnific magnificence of Solomon, right? Um, it talks about the magnificence of his riches and also his wisdom, right? So he had riches as far as material wealth goes, but he also had riches as far as up here, head knowledge goes, right? And remember, we have talked about this in the past, but there is a distinction between knowledge and wisdom, right? Knowledge, um, the word used for knowledge pertains more to um, just knowing the facts, right? Having access to or knowledge of the information, whereas wisdom is more about taking the knowledge, the information, the facts, and using them in an intelligent and smart way, right? So knowledge is more about just the facts, the information, and wisdom is more about what are we doing with that information, right? This is how we can use that information um, in a very wise, very beneficial, smart way, okay? Then the next section goes on to talk about Solomon's death. Um, from there, we get into the Jeroboam, Rehoboam, yada, 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 right? Israel rebe rebels against Rehoboam. Um, Rehoboam fortifies Judah, and then we read about Rehoboam's family, and then we close out this section uh, with uh, this person named Shishak attacking Jerusalem, okay? So I'm going to go jump down to the psalm real quick. We are, again, in Psalm 73. And I'm just going to start at the beginning and just kind of read through and make some comments, right? So starting at verse 1, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. <clears throat> so here it seems like there's kind of a qualifying statement going on, right? It's, it's saying God is good to Israel, but then it seems to go on and make a little bit of clarification to that. There's a comma, right? And then it says, to those who are pure in heart. So that makes me think that, that yes, in a sense, God is good to all of Israel, just like in a sense, God is good to all of us. The rain falls on the just and the wicked alike, right? Um, even for people that are reactively in rebellion against God, um, those people still have access and experience some of God's blessings, right? Um, however, this appears to be kind of making a distinction. It says, surely God is good to Israel, i.e., more specifically, in Israel, those who are pure in heart, right? That's just my take on that. Verse 2 says, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. Uh oh so here we see a little bit of, um, a little bit of drama creeping in to to the picture that's being painted, right? Um, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I nearly lost my foothold. Have you ever been in a place where you were on some sketchy terrain and you almost slipped and fell and it could have ended really badly, right? Um, have you ever gone to a rock climbing wall, you know, at an amusement park or at, at um, like an indoor trampoline park, that type of place? You know, sometimes they have rock climbing walls. Have you ever been on a rock climbing wall and then you lose your footing and you slip? Right? And even though you know you're, you're tied to the harness and you're safe, it can still be kind of nerve-wracking and scary. Um, or, or even something that is not as drastic as that. Have you ever just been climbing up a ladder? Right? And maybe you've got like a screwdriver in one hand 
and um, a tape measure in the other hand or something, and you're climbing up or climbing down, and you slip. There was a time when I was a kid that I distinctly remember, and it could have gone very badly for me. Um, I liked to play in the woods when I was a kid, and, and this was back in the, the early 90s probably. My friend Angela at the time, um, she was she was quite a tomboy, right? So me and her got along. We both liked to play in the dirt, play outside, make forts in the woods. And um, we just got along really well among some other neighborhood friends. But anyways, me and Angela were in her backyard. She had this huge forest. She lived right in front of just this big section of woods, right? And so we would go back in the woods and we would play and make forts. <clears throat> I remember getting a hammer and some nails. And we found some like chopped up pieces of, um, I don't even know what it was. Like some of them were little pieces of two by four. Some of them were like broken pieces from pallets. And we made a ladder going up this big, big tree. Okay. So we would take one of these little two by four pieces or a pallet piece. We would nail it to the tree and then we would go up a couple of feet and nail the next one and go up a couple of feet. And so we kind of made this ladder and I don't know if that was good for the tree, right? I, I would assume that driving nails into a tree probably wasn't the best for the tree. I hope we didn't kill it. But in any case, I remember distinctly that we would get a rope. We would climb up this ladder that we made. Once we got up to the top of the ladder, which was probably a good 20 plus 25, 30 feet up, it was up there. We would sit up on the top piece of, of wood that we had hammered in. <clears throat> we would take this rope, wrap it around the tree, wrap it around ourselves so that we were kind of secured to the tree and we wouldn't just fall off if the wind blew wrong, right? Well, I remember one day, I don't know if I was climbing up or if I was climbing down, but I was probably about three steps, three ladder rungs, if you will, off the ground. And it was damp out. I think that maybe it had recently started raining or it had been raining. The details are a little bit foggy. But I distinctly remember climbing up or climbing down, whichever it was, my foot slipped and I fell straight backwards. And when I fell backwards, I came down and landed right on the top of my back, like right where my shoulder blades are and my neck is. And I did not, I, I came out totally unharmed. I didn't have any broken bones. I don't think I even had any bruises. Um, I, I'm sure I landed on, you know, a pile of leaves or, you know, something relatively soft. It's not like I fell and landed on concrete. But nonetheless, if I would have landed a few degrees differently than the way I landed, I very well could have snapped my neck. I mean, it could have been seriously bad looking back in hindsight. So anyways, I know I kind of went off on a little bit of a rant there, but that is my story about, um, <clears throat> about my feet slipping and losing my foothold, okay? So anyways, uh, back to the psalm. So we read about, about the psalmist almost slipping and losing the foothold. And then he explains why and what happened, right? So here's what happened. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And isn't that easy for us to do, right? Um, we, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to judge people, especially people that I do not know. But the Bible does tell us that we will, generally speaking, know people by their works right? Um, we cannot look at a person for sure and know if that person is a believer or an unbeliever necessarily, but if you spent a little bit of time around somebody, um, depending on how much time and depending upon the type of conversations you've had, I think you can get a pretty good idea of whether or not somebody is quote-unquote wicked, right? I mean, obviously the psalmist is able to do that. The psalmist is saying, hey, I'm looking around and seeing all these wicked people prosper. I'm seeing all of these people who are not godly. They are against the Lord. They have no concern for anything of the Lord, right? They couldn't care less about God, yet they're having all these parties. They're making all this money. They've got all these women. They're rolling on SUVs with 22-inch rims, right? You see what I'm saying? So it can be very easy for me and if y'all are being honest, for you too, um, I would imagine that you can look around and see how sometimes being bad does pay, right? You know that old motto like crime doesn't pay? Well, sometimes crime does pay, right? Depending on what kind of crime you're talking about. I'm not talking about going and robbing a grocery store per se, but you get my point, right? Um, following God and trying to live righteously does not always equate to material wealth or um, an all-encompassing, fulfilling marriage, or a job that makes you feel complete, that is just the coolest thing in the world, right? I do believe God rewards those who genuinely seek Him and who obey Him, um, but I also believe that 
it's not a magic genie in a bottle, right? God's not our holy ATM machine. Um, so, so sometimes, especially if you are a believer in God and you are going through a trial or a trouble of some, t- of some kind, right? If you've recently lost your job and you're really hard up for cash, yet you see somebody else who's got a new car, a boat, um, they just got their house remodeled, and you know that this dude is just one of the wickedest people you've ever met, just a, a no-good slime ball, right? Um, sometimes that kind of thing can be super difficult. But anyways, uh, it goes on to talk about that. I'll read that again. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts come iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. Hmm. So that's that's just a little chunk from, from the psalm today that I wanted to cover, um, just because I know that I've been able to relate to that in the past. <clears throat> and the struggle is real, right? The struggle is real. Um, and, and you know what? If I'm, if I'm really being real, um, sometimes not only can it be easy to get caught up in a little bit of envy, a little bit of jealousy, um, when you see someone who you know is a quote-unquote bad person who is doing very well. But sometimes, have you ever been a little bit, a little bit jealous, just had that little hint of jealousy over another believer? who was succeeding in an area that you're trying to work in and they're succeeding more than you, right? Sometimes it can be hard to have joy when somebody else around you gets blessed, amen, right? Like if you're going for a promotion at work and another believer in Christ is going for a promotion at their work, you don't get your promotion, but they get theirs, right? It can be easy to feel bummed out and to think to yourself, okay, well, you know, I I should have got the promotion. I really deserved it. But look at this guy, right? He comes into work late. You know, I know he's a believer in Christ. He's a brother in Christ, but I just can't be happy for him. You know, I'm upset I didn't get my promotion, right? Sometimes we can even be jealous of other believers when good things happen to them, right? So I want to encourage y'all to try to keep things in perspective, okay? Keep things in perspective that Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, right? That, that if, if the wicked and the unrighteous in this life seem to be getting um, the upper hand, meanwhile you feel like you're trying to serve the Lord and it's costing you a whole lot in a whole lot of different ways, and, and you're tempted for just a moment to think, well, look, that person's not even trying to follow the Lord and look how good they're doing. Maybe I should go that route. Don't give in to that. Do not give in to that right? We serve an almighty God who is able to provide and who is able to work on us and change us, and we don't understand the things that he does. Sometimes we see it in hindsight, but we don't always see it up up front, right? So whatever it is that God's allowing us to go through, it's for a reason, and it is because he is shaping us into the person he wants us to be so that he can use us in the way he wants to use us. Amen? So I know that I'm kind of drawing this one out a little bit, but I will cut it off there. So hey, thanks for your time, and we'll do it again tomorrow. Until we meet again, Deuces.